possesses a real estate empire and an endowment worth almost $20 billion. It is the second wealthiest nonprofit institution in the world after the Vatican. In the last 15 years, while Harvard's endowment tripled, the university cut labor costs by breaking campus unions, outsourcing jobs, and slashing wages and benefits for Harvard's lowest paid workers. In 2001, Harvard enjoyed a budget surplus of $120 million, yet paid more than 1,000 workers poverty wages. You get to a point. You don't need a degree to know when they're getting screwed, to put it bluntly. It's unfair, and we won't stand for it. When do we want it? Now! Three years ago, the Harvard Living Wage Campaign started to speak with campus service workers. We found that they couldn't support themselves and their families on Harvard wages. We had faith that as we brought the truth about working conditions to the university's attention, it would respond. But despite gathering petitions, building a community coalition, and urging President Rudenstein to act, the university made no real improvements. And in February of 2001, after releasing a report calling for education programs rather than wage increases, the president declared the issue closed. Without success, we had tried everything to convince the administration to implement a living wage. Reasonable dialogue and community pressure failed. It didn't seem like there were any options left. In early February, we started planning an occupation of Massachusetts Hall. In the yard, you may see Harvard's president, as with Mrs. Conant, he walks towards his office in old Massachusetts Hall. two months of preparation. We arranged civil disobedience trainings, convinced reporters to come inside with us, and organized a team to coordinate support actions on the outside. Unions said they would try to support us if we could get in, but legally they can't be involved with planning civil disobedience. But as we're secretly gathering in a nearby basement, we are afraid that occupying the president's offices could mean the end of the campaign. Even if we manage to get into the building, We'll probably be arrested and dragged out. And we worry that such a dramatic escalation may alienate the broad base of support we've already built. If, it's, if we're not under arrest, but the police are trying to remove us, we do resist. Um, but if we're under arrest, we let go and then we choose to go left or not. Given the secretary a letter to support staff. People have letters ready for HUPD. Please put a letter under this door, somebody. Someone with a letter? Secretary. Under the door. What we want? A living wage. When we want it. Now. the door we're going to leave this position in three minutes we just want you to take that three minutes to look at our list of demands you maybe have some kind of conversation with us you you can't talk to us you're not allowed to let him you need to clear the doorway many times during the year i've been asked uh 
to talk about living wage and other issues, and we've always done it. Uh, I have office hours every two weeks open, uh, and I'm prepared to talk with people, but I'm not prepared to talk under these circumstances. Under the circumstances that we are allowed, you are not having living wage. Shame on you! 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 UPD, and it looks like the administration has cleared out completely. I hope you all said goodbye to President Rudenstein and to Mr. Harvey Feinberg as they exited. The administration released a statement saying they will not speak with us while we're occupying a building. They've stationed police at the entrances, and we've heard rumors that they might drag us out tonight. Despite the threatening atmosphere, some dining hall workers said they'd come by after their shift to show their support. Food is our business. And so what we did is bought pizzas, and we marched uh, in formation to uh, Mass Hall. And the police stood in front of us and says, nothing gets in. And we yelled back at them, whatever it takes, it's going to go through the front door or the windows. We will feed our students. Within 30 seconds, uh, a call by the police, uh, we were allowed to bring the pizzas into the front door. By the next morning, starting at 5.30 in the morning, it spread right through our ranks. Everybody knew what, what we had done, and we had formed an alliance now that was, that was not to be broken. You all have met Frank by now. He's a custodian. Like many people at Harvard, he works... 80 hours a week, he sleeps four, four hours a night. So I'm gonna share some words from Frank. I've been wearing a custodial uniform now going on 20 years. I've been wearing a custodial uniform now going on 20 years. I always say the only thing we don't have is a number across our backs. I always say the only thing we don't have is a number across our backs. It's amazing how much abuse people will take. It's, it's amazing, amazing how much abuse people take. They just sit back and take it. They just sit back and take it. I finally realized that as long as there's people willing to take it, I finally realized that as long as there's people willing to take it, there's people willing to kick us. There's people willing to kick us. Just because they're in a position to do it. Just because they're in a position to do it. I call this place the reservation. I call this place the reservation. We're allowed to think how mad we are. We're allowed to think how mad we are. We just better not say it. We just better not say it. 
And that's what we're here to do today, is to say what Frank can't say. It seems the administration doesn't want public attention for carrying us out in handcuffs. But the police are under orders to make life unbearable. And we constantly struggle to keep control of space in the building. We must fight to open windows so we can speak with supporters outside, keep police from entering our conference room, and hold on to the bathroom. We keep watch all night so we're not caught off guard and dragged out. The administration is being dishonest and they're refusing to negotiate. The only negotiations that are going on in there are absurd negotiations between students and police officers about who can be in what room, can you have access to the bathroom, there's space issues. We didn't go in there to talk about space, we went in there to talk about a living wage and we went in to get a living wage. We expect the administration to talk about a living wage and we expect these absurd space negotiations to just stop now. Privately, workers tell us how badly they need better pay. Since the start of the sit-in, however, their managers threaten to dock their pay, fire them, or even deport them if they come to the protests. But for us, the occupation can only succeed if it empowers workers to speak out publicly and take action. There were a number of people who said, well, why aren't the janitors, why aren't the janitors sitting in? Well, if the janitors had sat in, they would have been arrested in five minutes flat. Their union those who had a union would have been under super fines and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, the law uh, clearly prohibits them from doing this, and the university would have felt very free to put the full power of uh, their authority on, on these very vulnerable workers. On the other hand, with the students doing it on behalf of uh, these workers, well, the university needed to be a little more cautious. Uh, 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 and, um, and so I think it was, uh, in this instance, a valid, not a substitutionist, it was a solidaristic uh, action and strategy which, which made a lot of sense. We have to sing really loudly so they can hear inside, okay? No. Yes. Okay, ready? One, two, three. My Bobby and my Zadie would be proud of me. Standing up for justice and for liberty. Grandpa would sit me on his lap. Grandma would give my cheek a kiss. And they'd say, give the boss a kiss for me. first became involved in labor issues through the United Students Against Sweatshops, a national campaign to make universities like Harvard accountable for the overseas sweatshops that make university licensed apparel. As we've gotten to know workers on campus, we've come to realize that they face many of the same obstacles as those in sweatshops. Union busting, poverty wages, lack of benefits, and long working hours. We've come to understand the living wage struggle as one piece of the larger, ongoing struggle to resist corporate-driven globalization. I think there's an important link between the struggle for the living wage and the anti-globalization uh, struggle. And the key thing is that both of those campaigns are saying that human values and values of equity, values of democracy, values of justice, should supersede markets. That the market is not the sole arbiter of uh, what's acceptable. That in fact the market should not determine all of our relationships. All right, it's 7.30 everybody. 
It's time to get up. 7.30. Rather than cracking down, it looks like the administration is waiting us out. They bet that we'll have to give before they do. A few protesters have left, and we don't know how long we can sustain the occupation. Although the rallies outside are growing, local news has only run a few short pieces on the sit-in. Hey, David. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's Aaron, uh, Aaron Bartley calling from the sit-in at, at Mass Hall. Um, just want to speak with you about what's happening internally at the Globe, <clears throat> trying to get a sense of uh, why we're being shut out. Um, since you wrote the article last Wednesday, which I thought, by the way, was a good article. Um, please give me a call back at 617-233-8252. Um, even if they've kind of taken the story away from the business section, I'd just like to get your view on uh, what's wrong. <laughs> Um, I think it's possible that we won't uh, have access to any of those hired people anymore, that they might just not want to come in here, um, and that in that case the only people we do have access to are the people who do their work for them, who are their secretaries. And I think it's, I'm not saying definitely we need to do this, but one way to keep their work from getting done is to keep make their secretary's job uh, a little more difficult to do. It makes me a little bit uncomfortable to use, you know, secretaries like uh, extreme discomfort on the job as a way of getting to their bosses. Because I think that like the magnitude of what, of, like the pain we're inflicting, is going to be dulled many times. Like I don't think that their bosses care about, you know, secretaries' welfare as much as we should. Although admittedly, that's not our purpose. I just, I really wish that there was some other way, and I'd like us to try to think of other ways of reaching them. I sort of feel like we're in the long haul here, and I really think it's important to focus on what's actually going to get results from them. It's going to force them to meet with us, and from my perspective, that means much broader student support. I think that was a really good sign that the dining halls are behind, but trying to motivate people on the outside to disrupt the campus in other ways, if that's possible, and also focusing on things that embarrass them publicly. Get your sleeping bag, toothbrush, and tents, and help us make an even more visible presence of the living wage sit-in. Solidarity. So that's right, we're starting at Tent City out here tonight, starting at our vigil at 8 p.m. We realize that our occupation of the building cannot win a living wage by itself. Our civil disobedience has to spark further action. The administration still tries to ignore us, but with each passing day, pressure mounts as the community starts to take over Harvard Yard. This tent city is probably one of the most important parts of this action, this sit-in, uh, partially because it, it provides the kids on the inside who are sort of cloistered from the unit, from the world, uh, a sort of a visual, a visual representation on the outside. But also, blatant, uh, frankly, it's an eyesore. <laughs> you know, Harvard Yard, Harvard Yard was not meant to have like 70 green and blue and red and purple and black tents in the middle of it. We hope as time goes on, they'll see where the university is, what a progressive employer it is, and, and uh, we'll be able to stand on our record for the past 375 years. With momentum building, Harvard's administrators begin to fight back. They cut the public address system's electricity, intimidate workers by videotaping their participation, and try to lock supporters out of Harvard Yard. The Harvard News Office launches a public relations campaign, refusing to count outsourced workers as Harvard employees, calling the sit-in coercive, and claiming that free classes serve workers' needs better than higher wages. 
We believe there's always a balancing act when it comes to the social pressures on a university. Uh, our main responsibility is to the core mission, which is teaching and research. We think a better way to lift people out of lower paying jobs is through education, free education during the workday, to give a, a longer range potential of improvement. Why not both? I mean, we're talking about $20,000 a year. I wouldn't want to try to live on that, and I doubt that you would, you know, with a family. So at $10.25 an hour, that's $20,000 dollars a year it's it's why not both uh, yes we we could do both if we both if we chose to but we we choose to concentrate on education as we think a more uh, expedient way to raise people uh, into better paying jobs around this issue for three years. That's what we need to return to, calling students to attend our three daily rallies, pressing alumni to withhold donations, and coordinating solidarity actions with workers and unions around the country. Hundreds of formerly passive supporters are becoming active and politicized, putting pressure on Harvard that we could never have exerted ourselves. Workers speak in front of the building, the Ruckus Society runs civil disobedience trainings, and clergy conduct religious services in the yard. Thanks to the work of supportive professors, over 300 faculty members have thrown their weight behind the living wage, too. The letter had a big impact on the administration, I believe, because it, uh, what it did was it sent a very big signal to them that the faculty were not supporting their position. This is the CBS Evening News with John Roberts. Harvard students are demanding higher pay for hundreds of campus workers. Poverty wages at Harvard are gaining national attention. This is just what we are aiming for, but the issue's high profile may backfire. The business executives who comprise the Harvard Corporation and have final authority on this issue don't want this kind of labor precedent set. It may inspire similar actions against other employers. It is impossible for anyone to belong at Harvard without becoming conscious of the history that is everywhere about him. There are many evidences of this. The colonial buildings, the yard itself, the old college pump, the names in Hollis Hall, and we have many priceless treasures. There is none more priceless than the charter of the college itself which was given by the General Court of Massachusetts in 1650 and under which it still operates, the oldest instrument of incorporation in the Western Hemisphere. The Charter establishes the Harvard Corporation as the university's highest governing board. This group answers to no one, and its seven members choose their own successors. Corporation members also serve on the executive boards of the world's largest companies, including ExxonMobil, Corning, McKinsey, Coca-Cola, Tricon Global, and J.P. Morgan, among others. They direct corporations associated with extensive environmental, labor, and human rights abuses. The Azurex Corporation privatizes water supplies worldwide. DynCorp provides the State Department with mercenaries in Colombia. Enron, under investigation for defrauding thousands of employees, violently suppresses peaceful resistance to its Indian power plants. Every two weeks, these seven people meet to oversee the university. 
We are here once again to ask the Harvard Corporation why they refused to meet with us, why they ignored our letters, and uh, why they continue to block the implementation of a living wage. Uh, Mr. Winokur, why do you continue to pay Harvard workers poverty wages? I'm sorry, I'm a little late. I apologize. Excuse me. We're waiting for the package. I'm really late. I'd love to. Here's the truth. Instead of helping the workers who clean the classrooms, serve the food, and care for the grounds here, live the American dream, Harvard University is perpetuating an American nightmare, and the Harvard Corporation must accept full responsibility. I first want to salute the students who have been willing to put themselves at risk to stand up, to speak out, to put a face on people who are often invisible in our society. We can't work anymore like that. And we work hard to make constable offices, clean toilets, all right? Nice cafeterias. People like me and Jenny told me never talking loudly like I did or marching in the street complaining. But uh, it, it's something different. I never did that before in my whole entire life. I never think I can talk in, you know, I speak in public like that. And I never thought that I have the courage to do it. But the courage not for me. The people around me gave me this courage, support, you know. And like I said in the beginning, I didn't care if I lost that job, really, you know. But I, at least we lost him fighting. The president has decided that he wishes to address all of you in person. This will not be a time when we will engage in substantive issues. Uh, that will remain for a later moment. But the president thought it was very important, given the power of this moment, to convey to you his thoughts in person. Do you know uh, what time that will be? Time now? Right now. Yeah. I think this is an important matter of principle. Uh, if we've got to the point where the crowds are uncontrollable and people are getting hurt, uh, I'll do my best as a citizen to keep it calm. Uh, but uh, I, I cannot give in. And if the university is at such a point where people say it's so badly off that we must give in, I'll resign before we give in. And you'll deal with the next person. No justice, no peace. No justice. president met with protesters for the first time yesterday. Officials say the students could face serious academic discipline. The students were sitting in for us. That the consciousness of the living wage was now, that was, that was for us. And so he says, well, these are our children sitting in for us. We cannot let them uh, take the blows that is meant for us. A student sit in for higher wages for university employees turns into a rally at Harvard University. Uh, Seven's Douglas Zader is live on campus. Yeah, it's gonna be a pretty big event here. Let me give you a quick tour around here. You see all the students gathered behind me waiting for another big group of students to come here. Further over here to your right, you see the actual building that students have taken over. There are about 40 students still inside there. They can't leave because if they do leave, police will not let them back in. These are Sky Eye 4 pictures of a student protest that started within the past hour. You can see demonstrators now marching in the streets. They're demanding the university pay better wages to non-faculty employees. Canada's turns to protest. Several dozen of them walked from Harvard Yard over to Holyoke Hall to confront the director of Harvard's Office of Labor Employee Relations. They're demanding that $10.25 an hour. One of those protesting, a janitor who currently takes home $309 a week after taxes. Right now, I make $10 an hour. That's with over four years service. I started at $8.50. I had a retirement fund. 
Massachusetts has the third highest cost of living behind New Jersey and Hawaii. It costs 13% more to live here than in the average state, and the Boston area is even higher than that. Now, the U.S. minimum wage is $5.15 an hour. In Massachusetts, it's $6.75, the highest in the nation. But in Cambridge, where Harvard's located, the city has an ordinance requiring city workers to make $10.25. Students estimate that paying workers a living wage would cost Harvard about $10 million per year. That's about a half percent of the interest Harvard makes in one year alone on its endowment. When you compare anything against $19 billion, it, it, it looks like it's affordable, and affordability isn't the, the direct question. By one count, there are now living wage campaigns at 16 campuses, most of them started by students within the last year. Workers are now taking the sit-in as their own. They're speaking out forcefully and organizing their own actions for the first time in decades. Hundreds of custodians and dining hall workers from the Harvard Medical School joined the cause today with a campus march of their own. Workers say they want to tighten their bond of solidarity with the students and won't go away until they're guaranteed a raise. We're going to continue with running. As long as people keep coming here listening to what we have to say, we're going to be here. Several hundred students came to this rally today, and recently they've gotten some pretty powerful support. Yesterday, Senator Kennedy came by here, and they also have the support of the AFL-CIO. There is no power and uh, no immovable object that will not move. Administrators say they won't negotiate until protesters leave the building. But the protesters aren't budging, making it likely they'll leave either in victory or in handcuffs. <laughs> At first, we thought time was on the administration's side. And it's true that as time passes, people gradually have to leave. Our numbers have fallen from 50 to 29 students. But pressure still grows daily. There's an around-the-clock presence in the yard. Alumni are holding actions at Harvard clubs in New York, D.C., and Chicago. Faculty are demanding meetings with the president and labor unrest is spreading to new areas of the university. There is no sign of letting up here on the Harvard University campus. In fact, the heat is rising. You can see the tent city that is still set up behind me here in Harvard Yard. As students support Harvard workers from cooks to custodians get a better paycheck. In fact, tonight, one workers' union did find strength in the protest. Are you willing to support your negotiating committee to authorize a strike? Tensions hit another peak at Harvard University. These cafeteria workers could now walk off the job in a matter of weeks. When families have to decide to feed their children or take them to a doctor, to either fill a prescription or to pay the rent. And so they marched into Harvard Yard, which students have occupied for two weeks, supporting the fight of university laborers for a living wage of 10 25 an hour. being said because it was so loud and they took it on their own to, to be so loud because they were letting out their emotions um, in support of the students but also 
now they had the ability to, to let out their emotions against the anger they had at, at the employer at uh, Harvard University. And with thousands behind them. And now we can get you, you know. Now, everything you've done to me in my family, I'm coming to get you now. The administration has asked us to submit a tentative list of our demands, but still insists it won't directly engage in negotiations. So John Hyatt, who is Sweeney's lawyer, the general counsel of AFL-CIO, the most prominent labor lawyer in the country, um, has agreed to be our negotiator um, based on that. Uh, now that our AFL-CIO liaison has opened lines of communication, President Rudenstein has agreed to enter into negotiations. We follow their progress and relay our positions by conference call. The president is so afraid of appearing to have caved in that the talks are in secret. I think the administration came to appreciate that it was very useful to have organized labor uh, because to bargain you need an organized party. And, uh, uh, and so uh, it, it also reminds us of, of uh, one, of the, one of the advantages, I hate to say it, but for employers with unions, which is that unions give an organized voice. And if you contract out, union bust, or otherwise make it impossible for workers and students to have an organized voice, you don't shut them up. You just get collective bargaining by riot. And I'll tell you, every dining hall worker at Harvard University, all 550 f feel that this is the process. The sitting in these students are doing is our process. That is our negotiations. And we will continue fighting with the students here. As the energy, popularity, and militancy of the campaign grows, more and more workers risk their jobs to participate. Harvard's negotiating position weakens. As the threat of wildcat strikes and spreading civil disobedience continues, students and workers force the administration to negotiate a settlement. Only one week after President Rudenstein pledged to resign before giving in, community pressure finally compels him to accept a moratorium on outsourcing, unprecedented wage increases, and a committee to overhaul university labor policies. There are hundreds here now rallying in Harvard Yard. Students and the school administration here have reached some kind of agreement, but until they post their positions on their websites, no one is going to leave that building behind me. It's up, you guys. right now because I'm waiting for this moment to have those kids unbelievable they are my inspiration my hero you know people who fight together usually have a special bond before we had fought together we may be just hello buddy how are you things like that but now we sort of there's a closeness since May 2001, worker-student alliances have founded more than 40 new living wage campaigns on campuses nationwide. The struggle continues.